decades from the end of 1914, when trench warfare became prevalent across the majority of the Western Front. Despite the fact that Britain had undergone a steady decline in religious observance since the time of the Industrial Revolution, there was a widely held belief at the beginning of the conflict that the war would have the positive side effect of creating a religious revival. Contemporary commentators and historians alike have, however, been quick to note that this was not the case, and the religious impact of the First World War upon the British soldier has typically been seen in terms of a loss of religious faith. Supporting this, much evidence suggests that conventional religious observance was rare on the front, and recent works such as Edward Madigan's Faith Under Fire make it hard to deny that Anglican army chaplains in particular faced a range of difficulties in their attempts to influence the lives of the troops. However, accounts giving an overwhelmingly negative betrayal of religion during the war fail to acknowledge that, that a lack of interest in conventional religious observance on the front does not necessarily reflect an absence of religious belief. On the contrary, my research has demonstrated that although the majority of British soldiers had little time for formal religious observance, a good deal of them underwent a personal revival of religion. Using primary sources, predominantly diaries, letters and poems written by those who served on the front, I have seen that a kind of emergency religion was adopted by the soldiers to a great extent in order to cope with the horrors of war and the prospect of death. Indeed, the prevalence of behaviours such as prayer, the use of religious imagery and thoughts of fatalism and heaven suggest that a form of religion was used as a fundamentally important and necessary coping mechanism across the Western Front, despite formal religious observance being relatively rare. My research focused overwhelmingly on those who had a direct experience of what it was like to live continually exposed to death. The focus was also on the Western Front, since in terms of the number of casualties, the number of divisions employed, and its predominance in the political, military, and popular imagination, it was the most significant theatre of war from the British perspective. Whilst I picked up on a number of different ways in which this emergency religion was expressed in contemporary sources, I will consider only a few of these today. As Effa mentioned, there was a general decline in formal religious observance. So whilst, whilst it is true that hundreds of thousands of Londoners packed their churches on the first Sunday of the war, with the report in the Church Times stating that the first effect of war was, has been a great rush of people to the churches, this does not appear to have been the case on the front. <coughs> For example, very few men on the front attended the voluntary services, particularly the Anglican services, and the Anglican chaplain Neville Talbot claimed in 1916, after almost two years of serving with the British Expeditionary Force, that were the compulsion of church parades generally removed, in many cases only a small minority of men would muster to worship God. However, my evidence suggests that the reasons for this negative attitude towards official church attendance were not predominantly due to a lack of religious faith, but more because of other factors, such as the association between church parades and military discipline, the lack of specific training of the padres, and the social and cultural gap between the frontline soldiers and the chaplains. For instance, the lyrics of a popular soldier's song from the war reflects the relationship between religious service and military discipline, <coughs> describing some of the benefits of demobilization as, no more blooming kit inspections, no more church parades for me. Needless to say, this negative association did very little to help Orthodox religion. As chaplains noted, the sick and wounded were particularly receptive to their spiritual work in the aftermath of battle, and voluntary thanksgiving and memorial services were much better attended by the frontline troops, showing that they used religion to cope with the horrors of battle. Individual case studies confirm this point, such as that of Charles War, a 24-year-old, who suffered near fatal wounds in the Second Battle of Ypres in 1915. It was the regimental badge on his helmet which deflected a bullet and saved his life as he was being carried to the field dressing station. He underwent a spiritual revival and claimed that, I passed through a very strange experience which completely altered my life and I knew that I had drawn very close to God. War appropriately later went on to become a Church of Scotland minister in 1918 and then a senior chaplain in Scotland. Religion also appears to have helped soldiers cope with thoughts about death. For instance, 
What is distinctive in the primary evidence, particularly in war letters, is the vast amount of imagery relating to concepts of heaven and hell. As an example, Lieutenant Christian Carver, writing to his brother in November 1916, claimed that, consciously or unconsciously, one always pictures heaven, and I always find myself apt into slipping into an idea of a sanctified place. Taking this together with a vast amount of similar sources, it is fair to conclude that this emergency religion played a significant role in helping soldiers to cope with the fear of death by encouraging them to conceptualize heaven. Another aspect of this emergency religion that became fundamental to helping the private soldier cope with thoughts of death was fatalism. For example, a letter of GMC Bowman in 1916 claimed that, I have put myself entirely in God's keeping and suggested that his life was in God's hands and that for that reason he was not afraid. In a similar way, much evidence suggests that this, uh, this emergency religion commonly helps soldiers to justify their sacrifice. Imagery of Christ's soldier and biblical metaphors are common in the letters and diaries, serving as a source of courage, acting as a morale boost, and encouraging Christian morality at the front. Religion also served to provide practical help, particularly in the form of prayer, which is repeatedly mentioned in the memoirs and <coughs> contemporary accounts. For instance, in his memoir, H. Juggins stated that he prayed fervently and said that his strong religious faith in those days and the firm conviction that there was a better life beyond this one greatly mitigated the fear of his physical death. So that's given just a really brief overview of the prevalence of references to a significant emergency religion in the letters, diaries and memoirs of soldiers who served on the front line of the Western Front. What has been shown, though, is not only that an emergency religion was prevalent, despite a lack of formal religious observance, but that this emergency religion also served as a fundamentally important mechanism for helping the frontline soldiers to deal with their experiences. Thus, the all too common notion put forward by David Cairns, author of the 1916 Army and Religion Report, that this emergency religion was very elementary, can be challenged. It was not elementary, but critical for the soldiers. Despite these conclusions, it should, however, be noted that coming to any firm conclusion on a matter such as religion is highly difficult. Indeed, this is one of the main problems that I have faced with my research. Religion clearly is such a personal matter, and as such, it is very hard to accurately judge any soldier's religious thoughts or feelings merely through the medium of letters and diaries. Moreover, the sheer extent of differing views on religion makes it very hard to form any firm conclusions.